Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for coming out to this panel uh, about navigating the complexities of large language models. Uh, we know it's towards the end of the day, end of the conference, so uh, appreciate you guys being out here. Um, we'll start off with a round of introductions, um, and I can start by introducing myself. Uh, my name's Ankit. Uh, I work on model serving and GPUs and large language model inference here at Databricks. Um, helped create Dolly uh, when we put that out as well. Eric, you want to go next? Sure. I'm Eric Peter. I'm one of the product managers on the AI platform team. And I uh, look after kind of generative AI and large language models overall. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is... Hello, everyone. My name is Sai uh, Ravuru. Uh, I'm the senior manager of data science analytics at JetBlue. Uh, I manage a portfolio of operation data science, commercial data science, AI and ML, as well as business intelligence. And uh, also the or original creator of our internally built Blue ML, Auto ML, and Auto Deploy library. Hi, everyone. I'm Salman. I'm a machine learning engineer at Block. Our team at Block uh, sits as a foundational team, and we support all of our business units, such as Square, Cash App, and our team develops tooling for automating common data workflows, such as ETLs, model training, batch predictions. And for a lot of these tooling, we work with Databricks. So yeah, excited to be here. Awesome, yeah. So Eric and I are super grateful to have Sai and Salman here today. Um, they're the practitioners that we're going to be getting some great insights from. Um, and so we do have a wave for like regarding questions. We're going to try to use this Slido thing. Um, so if you could scan the QR code there, uh, please submit your questions there, and then we'll actually uh, use that to pick up some questions. We do have a set of prepared questions, and then we can go from there. Yeah, so we're, we're super excited for today's session. Re really what we wanted to do was we wanted to bring folks who kind of have hands-on experience, day-to-day -day experience, building and deploying large language models and, and generative AI, and have a discussion around kind of, you know, every wide-ranging discussion of everything from the applications, um, some of the challenges they, they have around finding use cases, how, you know, building generative AI differs from building traditional machine learning, um, talk through some of their approaches, build versus buy decisions, and then ultimately kind of, you know, talk, talk through some of the challenges they face and the different solutions that, that they found here. Um, so a lot of questions. Maybe we, we, we st kick off by saying, like, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear maybe some of the, uh, the use cases that, that you all have started with. Um, maybe, Sai, you want to kick off here? <clears throat> sure, absolutely. Um, so because we're a highly regulated industry, uh, JetBlue as an airline, uh, we started off taking baby steps into the generative AI world. Um, it often starts with just FAQ chatbots, and that's really you know what we started uh, internally called BlueBot. And uh, we eventually figured out, oh, you know, you could start adding in additional functionalities into the same line chain and have online you know lookup uh, data lookup and, and uh, you know operational data store lookup. So we started expanding the scope of that chatbot to ad additional applications as well, uh, such as you know your financial teams can access 10Ks and 10Qs and SAP data. Your operations teams can, you know, for example, uh, take all of the data uh, and insights from our digital twin solutions internally, also built on Databricks, and so on and so forth. So we slowly started expanding in that direction. Um, and uh, today, uh, we are dabbling with how we can essentially sell you know, additional functionalities from our LLMs into a much more bespoke marketplace, um, such as you know, for trip planning purposes, like you know, some other companies have already done so, and uh, also getting into the fine-tuning world with uh, uh, Aviation GPT. So we're trying to create a WebMD-style chatbot for all of our maintenance technicians so that they can access live data, sensor data from the aircraft, mixed with unstructured data from our aircraft maintenance manuals so that we can diagnose the, you know, or, or troubleshoot any uh, uh, faults with the aircraft live. So I would maybe love to hear some of your use cases. Yeah, for oh, us, okay. we're seeing, uh, I would say, so far, three large like teams. One is copywriting, where uh, imagine like at Square, a lot of business owners want to start filling out their item catalog. And we want to be able to quickly give them a source of inspiration when it comes to filling out these descriptions. So that's been uh, one use case. Another one, as I mentioned, is this retrieval augmented generation, where um, you have like a knowledge base and then quickly ingest that to start um, answer questions. And the third one that we're also starting to see is around code generation or even like more classically text generation where maybe uh, for some of our sellers they want to have a more 
freeform way to interact with the data. And like previously now we have a lot of like analytics dashboards, but maybe we want a quick way to like just talk to a text field and then get like a visualization of our data. So that's some of the things we're experimenting with on our side. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. So uh, just to follow up on that a little bit, like maybe start by like walking us through some of the, what's like, what was the history of how this kind of came onto your plate, right? Were there particular organizations within your business that immediately needed this and are immediately seeing impact? Or was it just everyone, a couple different areas? How did it go for you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, to be frank, I think the timing was just right and their team was just structured right into capitalize on this moment because um, we, um, you know, in data, uh, at JetBlue data science team, we have an AI and ML uh, division that are basically uh, serving as scouts in a war. So when new technologies come through, we often try it out uh, internally to see, you know, what is the are the possible before we ship it out to data science teams for deployment, et cetera, as well. So generative AI, you know, landed on our lap because we wanted to essentially serve um, all of our internal crew members during, you know, virtual pocket sessions. Folks keep asking the same questions over and over again. Over 20% of JetBlue's crew members, uh, you know, since the pandemic ha are new. So. You know, during our monthly town halls, they keep asking the same questions over and over again. So we wanted a solution for that. Um, and at the same time, we started building a digital twin solution and realized that deploying a, a product, an AI and ML product, in, a, in an organization of 20, 25,000 people is not easy. There needs to be a lot of change management involved. So we decided to put an LLM around it um, and essentially roll it out. And actually, it sped up our go-to-market efficiency and product launch immensely. So we were able to get a product out in, in a month as compared to at an airline that's really, really fast compared to, you know, maybe multi-year journey that other industrial companies might have, may have. So sorry, it sounds like you guys, you like, you, your team was kind of well positioned for success, even kind of preparing for this moment for a while. I know some of the customers I've talked to are kind of, you know, in some, some cases they're, they were a little caught off guard or they didn't, didn't have as large of a data science team. I'm curious, like, what advice would you give folks who are maybe, you know, they weren't quite as well prepared as, as you were for, for this moment? Yeah, I would say, you know, maybe try to take a look at the structure of your team. Um, I know every, every team's needs are totally different. Every organization's use cases are totally different. But I think uh, fundamentally, teams need to be structured in a chronological way as well. You know, who are your best performers that can quickly get the job done in order for, you know, that model to be shipped out for deployment, um, you know, um, in, in, in other organizations. So I think as a function of time, if you look at a, a data value chain or a maturity of the technology, you need some folks within your team focusing on the art of the possible and what's out there always, because if you don't, you'll be caught off guard. Salman, love to hear your perspective on it as well. Yeah, so um, at, at Block, we have, I would say, around 30 machine learning teams. Uh, a lot of the, uh, not a lot, some of these teams were already working on large language models for several years, so uh, we have teams such as um, the team that message, uh, manages the messaging hub. A business owners can go and see all their text messages, email messages uh, in that portal, and we've had language models that did auto-reply or um, appointment rescheduling with customers for, for several years now. And, but What's exciting now is we are seeing a lot more teams that are interested since, I would say, like early this year. And a lot of those applications are not in production yet, but we're seeing really new, like exciting use cases come up. One of the things that I talked about before was the item gen like description generator, which is productized today. And I think over this year, we'll see a lot more use cases. That's great. And I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, I think, Obviously, it's great to have a lot of use cases. One of the most important things is, you know, can those business use cases, like, actually drive value for the business? I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like, is there, is there one use case that bubbles up to the top for you in terms of, hey, this was the, the biggest business impact um, that, that it's had so far? I would say the chatbot they shipped out with our uh, Blue Sky Digital Twin product has been, you know, the biggest impact for us because any product that we've traditionally deployed uh, within the AI and ML space or, or, you know, within the data science team has taken us, you know, multiple years in the past. Um, and so, you know, by offering folks 
you know, a way to query against live data in a natural language sense has actually been a tremendous boon for us um, and our frontline staff. Um, obviously, it's got its own challenges in terms of prompt engineering and, and so on and so forth as well. But you know, baby steps, and we're taking that one at a time. Yeah, for us, I would say at Cash App, we have like millions of users, and a lot of the common queries, such as how can I reset my PIN, and uh, have been automated for a while. And I think now with LLMs, we can automate more and more of those types of like recurring questions. And that's massive, because when you have a consumer app with such scale, um, you would want to have like automated ways to like answer and then let humans like take care of the long tail. And yeah, so I would say that's, that's a really big one for, for Block. Awesome, yeah. So I guess, I guess like moving forward in time, right? Like when, when you guys were just getting started, what was the first kind of use case and what immediate challenges did you face kind of bootstrapping yourself off the ground on the first LLM use cases that you were deploying? I would say the FAQ chatbot was an obvious one. Um, I think for most organizations it is. Um, one of the most challenging part is actually um, trying to um, you know, be in a closed loop solution. Um, obviously there's OpenAI right now, there's multiple like, you know, closed loop models as well. You know, there was Dolly 2.0, et cetera. So how do you segment you know, the embeddings layer from the prompt layer and so on and so forth? So that was like the biggest challenge for us because we didn't want to obviously you know, have our data leak to, uh, you know, for retraining purposes out there. Um, so we wanted a closed loop solution, but at the same time we wanted the robustness of the embeddings you know, from an open you know, solution as well. So I think that was the biggest challenge that we had to architect around. Other than that was vector search. You know, how do we get real-time vector search, especially because we have live data flowing in? So that was uh, very crucial for us. So I'm glad Databricks has offerings now. I know we've been talking, so. Yeah, well, we're, we're excited for you to try it out. <laughs> uh, for us, I would say uh, reliability is, has been challenging. Uh, you really need to think about the product as a whole before you start thinking about, oh, does LLMs fit in here? Because a lot of the applications today need human oversight, or you can't deploy where there's really like low latency requirements. So na even navigating that product space to figure out, hey, is this a good use case for like applying LLMs? That, that's been one, one, one thing. And then also experimentation, like collecting the data that, that like we're trying to get there as a platform team where we provide the tooling to our customers team so that they can quickly experiment with new ideas. Um, and that's like an ongoing uh, conversation or thing that we're working on, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. And that, that's actually kind of an, an interesting segue. I think, you know, thinking about kind of providing platform tooling, I know probably 12 months ago, the folks who were doing machine learning were primarily data scientists, you know, kind of significant. I'm curious, like, with LLMs, has that user base kind of who is applying AI changed within your organization? Sai, what are your thoughts? I would say, in general, um, it's freed up a lot of time on our product management side as well as our data scientists because uh, the, the approach that we've taken at JetBlue is let's ship out an LLM with every product that we launch, you know? Because we can just take the product requirements that was gathered in the very beginning and then ship, you know, put it into an LLM and users can ask how to use the product you know, using an LLM. And so that, that really frees up you know, valuable development time on the data science side of things because we always have to keep explaining the features and, and so on and so forth. And on the product management side, we get immediate feedback as well around you know, what features are working in a product and what, what features are not. So th that makes you know, that the, the incremental changes in our, our AI and ML products that much more surgical and makes the entire development cycle that much more productive. Yeah, for us, we're also, uh, historically, we've like mostly served data and ML engineers, but now we're seeing a lot of like core software engineers who are interested to build with these tooling. And you gotta really give props to OpenAI for, for like releasing ChatGPT and their APIs, which have opened it up for a lot of engineers. And for now, our, our strategy towards this has been for people with ML experience, we're trying to let them deploy custom models on Databricks serving, and, and we encourage them to see like what we call the advanced path internally, but then for a lot of 
folks who don't have ML expertise, we suggest a simpler integration with um, OpenAI or Google Palm today. But we do think those paths are going to start converging as, uh, I know, like with the Databricks API gateway, and as we have like a more curated list of models that we can start like recommending to our customer teams, I do think there's like in the in the near future we'll we'll see like those paths converging a little more. Yeah, great. Um, Eric, should we take one question from the slides? Yeah, I, I was just doing a little curation and sorry, I'm not trying to ignore questions. I think we're trying to avoid kind of specific technical architecture discussions here to, to avoid exposing kind of any anything proprietary, but. Maybe we take the most popular one, like, what are some other use cases at LLMs apart from chatbots? I think you guys have mentioned a few, but I don't know. What would be one that would pop top of mind? I think you both have them. Yeah, I think the, the code generation stuff would be something we're seeing. Um, there are different teams within, like, Block that try to do reporting. And that's, like, a very intuitive way that we can let our customers like ask questions about their revenue or their data or what are the products that are selling the most. Um, maybe like segment by like seasons or months of the year. Mm. Um, so I think that's a very interesting use case. There are some teams like dabbling in LLM agents. Um, yeah, that's nowhere near productionization, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's fun stuff. I think for us, um, two areas that we're dabbling in is one, um, you know, trip recommendations and product recommendations. Um, that's a that's a natural use case, as well as uh, you know, text completion. So for our uh, you know use case on the maintenance side of the business, for example, um, often when when an, a maintenance event happens on let's say an aircraft or a physical asset. Um, you know, there's a logbook associated with it, and maintenance technicians would go out and write some gibberish, right? Um, and often we wouldn't be able to understand it, we wouldn't be able to translate it. Even if you use that language to retrain your LLMs to better understand the state of every aircraft based on what's being written, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it because there's so much noise. So we're using an, an LLM up front that's fine tuned from some of our aircraft maintenance manual data so that we can uh, have text completion so that as they're entering in text, it auto completes for them so that way it actually helps with the, the data you know input component um, going into the LLM retraining processes just one quick note on the questions I think unfortunately the way it works you can't see all the questions so there's a bunch of questions in there so please continue to upvote I don't think you can downvote but please continue to upvote if there are other ones that you want us to get to next yeah I, I was actually gonna say like I think there's a class of questions in there and, and one that we're thinking about which is about platforms, right? And how do you make a platform decision? Um, and that might include, like, what's different about buying a platform for traditional machine learning and for large language models, or, or is anything different? So I'm, of the, I'm a strong advocate of the strategy that Databricks has right now around integrating LLM technologies into the existing stack, because that's the way we approach it as well. We want anybody at JetBlue, for example, to launch chatbots. So that's the reason why we're, we've abstracted out our entire LangChain process into our Blue ML model. So you start with a base model that we've fine-tuned and created internally within the AI and ML team, but then you know, offer the capability for teams to add in their own documents along the chain as well. So that has been a real good success for us because it involves all of the business units and the overall development process with just you know, one or two lines of code. Yeah, so was the question around like build versus buy for the it's, it's however you want to interpret it, but like I, I guess like do you feel like there's something different about buying an ML platform or do you feel like there's an LLM platform that you need to buy separately? Yeah, I, I, I think I would agree with a lot with Sai said and, and we've been using Databricks for the, the serving component and we have our model registry and ML flow and I think in general, what when we think about like buy versus build, it's it depends at which layer it is. So if you consider the base layer to be like OpenAI and uh, Google Palm and AWS Bedrock, then the second layer could be something like Vector Database. And if for those components, we're trying to think that is it too early to like buy something right now, or do we like hold off and see where this goes until then like just use like off the shelf components or open source tooling. And I guess that's where our head's at is like, do we wait for a gen two adoption? I would also add to that and just say, um, 
You know, I think naturally every organization starts off with probably OpenAI. Um, let's be honest over here, um, just to sort of see what the are the possible is. Um, and I would uh, almost uh, always say, well, try it out with your most risk averse components. So general things like FAQ that you don't mind losing data out to the internet and nobody can do anything else with it. So try it out and see whether you know you can build a framework around that and then replace the opening eye components. See what it does and then experiment with it. So take an iterative approach to this rather than just going out there and buying right off the bat. That's an interesting, it's, it's almost like a modularity approach. I'm curious like how have y'all achieved th that ability to start with one thing and then move to uh, Langchain really helps. <laughs> uh, I think uh, you know every day there's new functionality being built into obviously Langchain, and uh, you know super excited for all of the work that's being done. And uh, I think it's also a lot of work to obviously keep up with the technology and the ongoing developments. Um, but you know we've managed to do that internally by by having you know regular weekly talks and you know run round robin circles that we're able to discuss all of the, the pitfalls of you know, generative AI versus you know, the other technological advancements that are happening. So that's helped us quite a bit. So have an open conversation internally and have an open conversation with your, your C-suite and your board as well in an organization. That really helps. Yeah, and, and just to add to that a little more, I do think there's gonna be like really good like LLM tooling coming up over the years. Um, but for now, we're still trying to keep a pretty lean LLM stack, which is, uh, let, like, let's see what our customer teams build with it, and as a platform, we're gonna stay on top of it and provide them with the tooling and, and you know, arm them with the tools that they need to build, like, yeah, applications. Yeah, um, so I guess maybe, like, speaking a little bit to the point you were just making, right? Uh, and I saw this question up there as well, and it's a tough one for us to keep up with as well. Like, every week it feels like something new is happening in the large language model space. How do you approach that as an organization? Like, you know, do you try everything new immediately? How do you like make it so that you're not always kind of looking at a different new thing every week, but still keeping up? You definitely need an R&D arm. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think there needs to be a, a little bit of investment at the from the highest level uh, to have some kind of an R&D team. You know, always looking at what the next frontier is and experimenting with it. And that's the only way you know whether something works or not. But at the same time, having a sandboxed environment we can try that in, and, and a sandbox set of data that you can try that in is super critical as well. So that, you know, obviously the teams are not running wild and it's, it's not the wild, wild west internally in the organization. Yeah, for us, we, we recognize that this space is like rapidly evolving. And we've also tried to like just create our roadmap in a more like flexible way so that we keep time to like address things that are gonna come up. Other than that, um, like internal Slack channels, there's always people posting about, and at one point you just pick and choose what, where to focus, like if, if I'm gonna try out this new library or not, and yeah, so we leave that to individuals, but I think baking in that flexibility in your roadmap is critical, because the space is rapidly evolving, and it's hard to know where it's gonna be like six months from now. But I will say one thing just to add to that. Um, it's actually really, really helpful to get your your base crowd in an organization riled up around you know ChatGPT, you know they're excited about it. You know, capitalize that excitement and build upon that. So you know, obviously, it, as you get more people involved in the entire development process and prompt engineering process, the feedback process, you know, as they're excited from ChatGPT, you could you know have them see the are the possible. Oh, I could use this for my use case, my productivity internally, et cetera and have a centralized mechanism through which you can collect that feedback as well. We use Airtable internally to, to, to essentially collect all of the feedback you know, from all of the, the folks that are using all of our chat bus to, to really look at you know, uh, and prioritize what other use cases can we tackle like one by one next. Yeah, and for us, we've been um, doing a lot of demos internally and tech talks, because when you go on Twitter or somewhere, it's every week you're seeing some really cool demo, but a lot of the times they're cherry picked and you don't really know what's actually productionizable. So we're talking to teams who are actually doing this in practice and getting them to come and do tech talks for the rest of the company, where you can see the experimentation phase and then how are they doing evaluation? And then how, what, what are the challenges right now to putting something into prod? And, and that's really helpful for like, practitioners to see because they get a lot of ideas from that. That's, that's super helpful. And you you kind, of, kind of both have teased a little bit at this idea of like, 
what's a complete experiment uh, versus what's an actual prototype versus what's demoable versus what's in production. I I'm curious to hear your thoughts on some of the challenges from the, you know, the far left side all the way over to it's a scalable, reliable service that the entire company re relies on. Yeah, I think um, you know that, that feedback process from the users is actually very, very useful because you want to establish what are maybe some of the prompts that you want to zero in on absolutely. What are five or ten flavors of questions that you need to get it right right out of the bat because they're going to be using it constantly, you know, uh, over and over again. And maybe that's 20% of maybe the overall you know, set of requirements that you want to cover. And you let them know that, you know, for these 20% of the questions, you've got a solid answer. But we're working on those other 80% of the questions in terms of prompt engineering, and you can help us along this process as well. So that, that you know, is actually how we approach it. Yes, similar. I, I think there's a lot of value to doing like core data science work where you figure out this is my opportunity, but if I could get like 20% of these questions, that's a huge frequency. And I would say those are like use cases prime for like yeah. building in. Yeah. Um, so I, I think like the number one question on here is, is kind of related to this topic, right? It was like, you know, you're, look, you're talking about prompts that you want to be really good at. What about prompts that you're afraid of, right? Like, how do you manage the guardrails, such as, like, preventing people from asking off-topic questions from people or low-confidence responses from the model that could damage the trust uh, people have in, in that system? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and that's part of the reason why we've taken a phased approach, uh, because we get asked from the very top level, you know, what if somebody at JetBlue, let's say, uh, asks some sensitive questions, how do, you, how do you tackle that? You know, it could be in a legal bind, for example. So we have two sets of filters, one at an embedding layer and one at the prompt layer. So when any of these like keywords are triggered, we automatically spit out a statement saying that you know this chatbot is not utilizable for like this purpose kind of a thing. So you, you need to have multiple filters in place like in order to capture all of these. But of course, it's not going to be you know totally exhaustive. So it's going to be an iterative kind of a process to constantly adjust these filters. Yeah, uh, for for us, we're actually looking into building in guardrails into our platform because we know anyone working with LLMs will need to have some guardrails. Can you like fully like prevent it? Um, we're not sure, but at the minimum having guardrails like security checks is, is important. So we've been recently looking into LangKit from Y Labs where, uh, and then OpenAI's moderation endpoints, another example of that, which would flag like toxic or harmful, like unsafe, um, based on what the text input is. And depending on that, your, your downstream, um, like, yeah, application can handle however it wants to. The other thing we, we've been looking at is uh, also just logging inputs and outputs so that you can, like, analyze it later in a batch fashion. And, yeah, I think those things would be critical to, like, build in to the platform itself. I echo that. Actually, two things. One, logging capabilities is super underrated. I would highly, highly recommend if you're not logging you know, any of the, the underlying activity, please do so because you need to backtrack and obviously you know, prove out if anything you know, wrong has been said in the chatbots. The second thing is access-based control. So one of the things that we're really excited about is actually using Unity Catalog for the ACLs. Um, so that you know we can give role-based access to certain documents along the lang chain to specific users. So that is actually pretty instrumental in terms of you know which user or which user group gets access to what kinds of information. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Oh, go on. Yeah, the other thing I would say is also think about how you structure your business problem as a like ML problem because if you're generating at the end, then yeah, it's really hard to prevent these outputs. But another way of looking at chatbots is still text classification. And then the downside there is, oh, I can't really have like multi-turn conversations. But then you could probably do like query rewriting as a way to still have that, where you take care of like ambiguous queries by doing a rewrite, and then your last step is still classification because that's safe. So I, I mean, that's like one example of uh, how you could like also like make sure that you don't have any chance of, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I know we, we were like joking a little bit before this talk that like some of the core fundamentals of ML are still apply to LLMs, and if not, in many cases, apply more. And I think in this talk, we're kind of hearing monitoring and logging and kind of the core core things. I, I'm curious, like, are there 
any fundamental differences that you see between the process that you used for classical and deep learning from the process that you're using for LLMs? Or are there a lot of similarities as well? I think it's back to basics. You're absolutely right. I think a lot of people have gone so deep into the deep learning world that they forget, you know, um, what it is to create a model from scratch, you know, what, how, for example, um, inaccurate data could add noise, for example, like drift capabilities and so on and so forth. So it really is back to the basics because they have, uh, when you look at it at the end of the day, you know, it's just similarity search. That's basically it. So um, you just have to make sure that obviously you have the, the data in the right place, the embeddings in the right place, unstructured versus structured and so on and so forth uh, in order to tackle all of that. Yeah, um, pretty much echo what you said. And I think what's, what's really like the one big benefit of LLMs and, and, and this in-context learning or, or the benefits that we see with few-shot learning here is the time to launch your first product or your first experiment has gone down drastically. So I would like urge everyone to think about how, how can you get it out in the hands of your customers. Start logging things, because your next iteration is going to be better. You'll be learning from everything that you've put out in the first place. And, and yeah, that's, that's the process. So, so there's like a couple of interesting follow-ups that people um, have discussed here, which are like around security right, and monitoring. right. So we, we talked about guardrails from a content point of view. Have, has it ever been brought up in a security review or something like that, like, hey, is it possible to do a prompt injection? or are, there, are we introducing any additional risks here? What's important about how you addressed it to address those concerns? That's a, a great question and probably a multi-billion dollar question as well. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, organizations, especially high, highly regular industries such as ourselves, um, we prefer a closed loop solution, but we know that's not realistic as well. So we, we put together an open loop solution with a closed loop solution guess the architecture. Uh, and then, you know, we essentially rolled that out for our FAQ chatbot because it was low risk, you know. Um, and then beyond that, we, you know, are going towards a much more closed loop solution with, you know, some of the MPT models that we're trying out um, so that nothing gets leaked out to the internet. And at JetBlue, we've created a Gen AI council as well. And that goes all the way up to the C-suite and the board. Um, so I'm part of the council along with our CISO, our director of infrastructure, as well as you know my uh, boss uh, on the uh, uh, the data side. Uh, so we all obviously you know work together to 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 agree on what's right, what's wrong, et cetera, before we roll it out. Yeah, prompt injection. Uh, we we're actively looking into this today. I think the best solution is again use another statistical model <laughs> to. Um, guess whether like this is a prompt injection type query or not. Uh, but I do think this is um, an area that there's going to be more creative like solutions coming up and better ways to deal with it. And it's top of mind for us as a platform team as well. well what I'm hearing is if there are any entrepreneurs out there, you should sell these, Please two, work on these this. two folks a uh, prompt <laughs> injection <true>. solution. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, I guess like diving deeper on that, right? Like, we were talking about prompt injection, but like when you think about outputs, I think compared to traditional machine learning models, right? These these outputs are actually text as opposed to maybe statistical, like you know things like numbers that you can easily c get a distribution on them. How do you actually measure the quality of your model? Uh, like this is something we struggled a lot with when we were building Dolly. We were literally slacking each other different responses to a set of canonical questions on every checkpoint of the model. Uh, and you know, and then it was like, do we feel like it's better? Kind of, um, and and so it was. You know, we described it as uh, a little bit glib, like just vibes. Uh, how do you guys look at uh, evaluating the outputs of an LLM? For us, uh, I think the best way to do this is still human evaluation, uh, where and it's really tough because there are all these papers that suggest, for example, for summarization. Like, Rouge is not a good metric. I think Chatbot Arena does it in a nice way where you have, like, multiple models and you compare their outputs for the same prompt or the same, like, question that you ask it. And that's a, a really good way to do it. The downside of this is it's not really scalable. And there, I, I think logging would be one important <coughs> aspect of it. And I think it should follow up with clever sampling and then 
I do think we would need some sort of like human evaluation at the end of this. I, I just don't see a way around it. Yeah, crowdsourcing is a, is a really underrated component. Um, so the thumbs up and thumbs down, you need that um, on every chatbot because you need to track what works and what doesn't work for the end user. Um, and I would almost also recommend um, and we were actually talking about this yesterday, um, having some kind of a, a counter um, when a prompt is, for example, asked around how many other times this question has been asked is incredibly powerful because that also reinforces the model in terms of you know, where that, that, that similarity circle is drawn across. So um, you know, showing that to the user is incredibly powerful. If, for example, that, that prompt has been asked for the first time ever, they need to know about it because you know, then they know it's inaccurate, for example. Yeah, and like I would say to everyone who's trying to develop with LLMs, think about the product experience and how can you collect feedback from your users in a clever way, whether that's like a simple example of that again is if you generate a description, do you know if they're accepting it versus editing it versus completely rejecting it? And like put in those controls so that you can collect those events and then those would serve as labels, or at least it filters down your like, search space when you iterate on the next model. Back to the basics. Talk to your users, log yeah. everything, monitor it. Super interesting. So I know we've only got a few minutes left. Ankit, do you have any? I mean, like, maybe let's get some closing thoughts from the two of you on, like, if you were advising the folks in this room about how to get started, um, and how to address you know, challenges as they build out LLM applications, what would be one last piece of advice you'd leave people with? I would say start now. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, you know, maybe uh, thought out there around you know, that this technology is going to evolve a little better, and then you know, I can probably get a model that is better suited for my context, and then maybe I can start off from there. So may maybe let's just wait for a year and see where this goes and, and start off there. That is never going to happen. <laughs> a chatbot a chat built in a context that's ready-made and easy to use is not going to be available like ever. You have to do the legwork up front. So doing the legwork up front in order to better build that context internally and the feedback process and the, the framework really helps you understand what works and what doesn't work for your organization before you go too far deep in. But start somewhere. You know, don't just put it off. Yeah, I would say think in two stages. The first one being is this even a feasible idea? Can I build with it? And for that experiment with the best out there, like GPT-4, MPT, like whatever it is, like do your cost analysis. And don't think about solving the entire thing. Just take a small chunk of the problem and try to see if that improves things compared to where you are today. And then in the next step, I would say, then you can start thinking more about scaling or optimizing for cost. But it's important to s separate those two out as like experimentation versus like optimization. Well, I think, thank you folks. I yeah, think thank you so much. Huge, thank you. huge round of applause. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Folks. All right, I think that's it for us. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out and we'll be here for a couple more minutes. So feel free to come up if you have questions. Thanks everyone.